we're in the middle of a heat wave. And it seems that no matter what you do in the course of the day, you feel drained at the end of the day. And it takes a fair amount of effort simply to come here and meditate. And when you're feeling weakened by the, the temperature and tired from your work, your defenses are down, and feelings can become very prominent. We talk a lot in meditation about not believing your thoughts. Well, the same principle applies to your feelings. I mean, that's harder, because feelings have gotten into the body. They're thoughts that have provoked reactions in the breath. They can lead to a lot of discomfort, tension, or exhaustion, depending on how you breathe around a particular emotional issue. And those feelings seem a lot more believable, even when they're crazy, the fact that they're in the body. You feel like they're surrounding you. And we tend to take our feelings and our moods as a given. Thoughts can come and go, but it seems that moods last for a long time. Therefore, seem more real. But you have to remember that they too are fabrications. They've been put together and they can be taken apart, and other f moods and things can be put in their place. And when you don't feel like it, remember John Cha's statement that. The practice is the sort of thing that you do when you feel like doing it and when you don't feel like doing it. Why is that? It's because it's a duty. Now you might ask, who's imposed this duty? Nobody's imposed the duty. But your own suffering is what pushes you. And the duties that the Buddha assigns, of course, are the duties in the Four Noble Truths, and they're duties in your favor. It's not like some god has come down and simply ordained that this has to be that way and that has to be this way. The Buddha, as an expert, discovered how the best way is to treat suffering, how the best way is to deal with a cause. You try to comprehend your suffering. And part of that includes seeing it come, seeing it go, so you see what comes with it, what goes with it. In other words, what's causing it. Once you find the cause, then you can abandon it. This requires that you develop the path and that you realize cessation. Now these are duties in your favor. They're for the sake of your happiness. So no one's imposing them on you. It's simply that you realize that there is suffering. And the question is, do you want to sit with it continually? Do you want to keep on causing more and more suffering for yourself and others, or have you had enough? There's an article I read years back about the, the ways that people tend to deny blame for harming other people. It's like denying that they did anything themselves to begin with. They weren't responsible for what happened. Or if they were responsible, didn't really do any harm. Or the person being harmed doesn't really count. Or that whatever suffering there was served a higher purpose. Or they turn around and they attack the accuser. And when you think about it for a bit, these things are ways people try to push away any blame about harming other people, but they also are ways that we use to justify harming ourselves. Say we can't do anything about it, well that's saying that it's beyond me, I can't change anything, I can't be responsible. It's just the way I am. That's one way of pushing things off. Or well, the other said, well, what I did really doesn't go into any harm. This suffering I've got, this is just natural, this is normal, the way things got to be. Some people deny their own worth, say, well, I, maybe I don't deserve to be truly happy. There's that kind of thinking. Or the idea that the suffering serves a higher purpose. I've been working on this project on the book on Buddhist Romanticism and noticing that for the Romantics and a lot of other people in the Western tradition, 
there's an idea that if not God, at least the universe has a bigger purpose for which we should sacrifice our well-being. Then again, that's to keep us tied down, prevent us from escaping, making us feel that we're betraying some higher purpose by trying to pull out of the cycle. And so the Buddhist teachings that you know, the universe really doesn't have a particular purpose. The fact that you were born, nobody else hired you to be born, nobody else is out there setting out any tasks you've got to do. That's really liberating. And then, of course, the final approach is turning on the Buddha, turning on the teacher, saying, I can't do this. This is unreasonable. I'm out of here. So you have to look at the ways your mind allows itself not to practice, either just to slough off for a while or to say, I'm, I'm done with this, and learn how to realize, no matter how strong the feeling is, if it's a voice like this, it's lying to you. After all, this is your suffering that you're suffering, and it does matter. And something can be done about it. Here's the path. It's all set out. And you matter. And the suffering really is harmful. And it's not serving any higher purpose. In the Buddha teaching this wasn't expecting anything out of anybody. As he said, the highest homage to him was to practice. So just as we say not to believe your thoughts, remember, don't believe your feelings either. Think of a John Lee's analogy. Thoughts going through your head, well, who knows if they're really your thoughts to begin with? It's not just through your head or through your brain. It goes through all your body. So learn to use the breath to clear things out in the body. And remember that the duties of the Noble Truth are imposed not from the outside, they're things that you impose from inside. It's one of the reasons why we have to be self-starters in the practice. The phrase we chanted just now, chandang janeti vayamati urdiyang arapati chittam bhaganhati badahati, generating desire. This is a sign of wisdom and discernment that things you feel like doing, you know they're going to be harmful. You're able to talk yourself out of doing them. Things you know are good for you, but you don't want to do them. You know how to talk yourself into doing it. You learn how to generate that desire, either through the principle of heedfulness, the principle of compassion for yourself and other people, the principle of pride. Here you have an opportunity to master a skill. The ultimate skill. The sense of shame. Here is the opportunity to practice. You don't want to throw it away. So figure out which way you most effectively can motivate yourself to practice. Learn how to be a self-starter. Because just as nobody hired us to be born, nobody's hiring us to practice. We're here voluntarily. You've got the ability to, to do the practice. You have to ask yourself, do you really want to put an end to suffering? Have you had enough? Or do you want more? The Buddha didn't promise it was going to be easy. But he did promise that if you really do the work, the results really will come. This is what he calls the miracle of the practice. Someone once suggested to him that he would attract more students and get the Dharma out there more effectively if he showed a few more miracles. And he pointed out, well, there's the miracle of mind reading and there's the miracle of making things appear. He says, people who see that, well, some people are, are, get more and more dubious about it. What's going on here? Maybe there's a trick. 
It's for that reason he didn't want to display miracles. But he said there is the miracle of the teaching. That it's the kind of teaching that promises the end of suffering, and if you do it, follow it, it really delivers. There's not that much out in the world that really delivers like that, which, which is why his teaching is miraculous.